this morning is a bit of a discussion session. We're going to start off with a couple of a couple of more formal presentations, um, and then this ha after the tea break, we're going to get you involved in doing doing a little bit of work because that's what it's all all about, really, is to get your views. So, as you probably know, um, the institute was chartered at the end of 2014. Um, at the moment. It's the institute that's chartered, not its members, um, as, as Mike Heaton was very helpfully pointing out in yesterday's Plus en Change session. Um, but the intention has always been to investigate chartered membership for individuals. Chartered archaeologists has been a key feature of our strategic plan, um, which runs from 2010 to 2020. And we we're very fortunate to be awarded the charter for the institute smack bang in the middle of that strategic plan. So now it's time to look at the next step and what we do next. So possibly quite unusually for some consultations, uh, we're actually starting with a, a fairly blank sheet of paper. Um, we don't actually know whether our membership want chartered archaeologist status, although we did a straw poll at the inaugural AGM of the Chartered Institute and everybody seemed quite keen on the idea there. Um, so the first question really is to ask people whether they think that's a good idea for us to pursue, um, and then to think about what it means, what we would, what we want chartered archaeologists for, um, and then go on to have a look at how it might be, how it might be awarded, what the processes might be. So, in order to do that, we've um, had a series of workshops to to start things off um, around the country. They to be to be truthful, they haven't been brilliantly well attended, but the smaller numbers have allowed for a um, very targeted discussion, which has actually been really useful. And uh, what we've tried to do in the report that, that, that we've circulated to you today is to pull together some of the key themes that have come out of those workshops. Um, I didn't know until I started writing this report whether any of the opinions, which as you might imagine were, were, were wide and, and, and varied, would actually sort of coalesce into any any sort of consensus, but fortunately, fortunately, when we started writing it up, they, they did, and there are some options in the report. Um, but I think it's really important to stress at this stage, we haven't actually discounted anything, and if there are options that aren't in the report, or, or thoughts, or ideas about what chartered archaeologist is, why we might want it, and how we might get it, um, that aren't in there, we need to know about that from you. There's a link at the end of the report um, to, a, to a survey monkey questionnaire which asks um, uh, for your feedback on some specific questions. I'll talk about the report in a little bit more detail later on, but one of the key features and one of the things that's been really useful about the workshop sessions has been to have guest speakers from other chartered institutes to tell us about how they confer chartered status in their profession. And they've been, we've had a number of guest speakers, and that some, in some cases from quite different industries. So the Institute for Textiles, for example, um, an, uh, an industry that, that has absolutely nothing to do with archaeology and archaeologists. Um, we've had the Institute, Chartered Institute of Ergonomics and Human Factors um, to talk to us about how they do it. Um, and today, we're very lucky to have Amy Pierce, who's from the Science Council. Uh, she's an archaeology graduate who's ended up at the Science Council via the Chartered Institute for Water and Environmental Management. Um, so she's going to kick us off today talking about how scientists, where science, chartered scientists come from. So, hi. Um, as Kate said, I'm from the Science Council and I'm the Professional Standards and Quality Manager at the Science Council. And I've worked with professional bodies for about eight years now. So I've spent five years processing applications and now I've spent three years developing the standards for chartered scientists and registered scientists and registered science technicians to adhere by, um, which is a challenge. Um, so I'm just going to give you a bit of a background on who the Science Council is and where we started. Um, so the Science Council is a governing body slash membership organisation um, that spans several disciplines and sectors throughout the science profession. Um, it ranges from the Institute of Brewers and Distillers, to food science and techni techni technicians, to your standard physicists, chemists, not standard, but your typical chemists, physicists, biologists. Um, and we started in 2003, so and we got, gained our Royal Charter in 2004. So we've been issuing licenses for chartership for 12 years now, which is 
quite a long time um, for us, but not long in the whole history of chartership when you've got your engineers who've been going since the 1800s. Um, we're focused on education skills and professionalism throughout the science workforce um, and we try and bring them together through professional registration, um, our governance, our policy work and a number of working groups and networks that we all get our volunteers through our licensed bodies to be a part of. Um, so we offer um, registered science technician, registered scientist, chartered scientist and chartered science teacher, um, but that's just for the Science Council um, in general. Um, we have 30, well, we have actually 40, I got the slide wrong, we have 40 professional bodies who are members of us. And out of those 40, 27 hold a license for um, chartered scientists or the other registers. But from that, 10 have their own chartership as well. Um, and then 11 also hold licences with the Engineering Council and the Society for the Environment. So it's not just about having a, license, a chartership for your own um, specialism, but it's also discipline specific as well with the chartered scientist or the chartered engineer or the um, environmentalist. So I did a bit of, when Kate approached me, I did a bit of um, ringing around our licensed bodies and asked them what they felt charge shipment for them um, and they came up with these four main um, these main reasons why they have their own charge ship or why they have a license with us and they see it mainly as um, great career progression for their members it demonstrates an achievement for their members at certain points within their career um, the introduction of technician licenses also means that people who are proud to be a technician who never want to be chartered can have a recognition in, in its own right as well. So it's not just about that senior level as some people see chartership um, because for a long time I think chartership was seen as an old, an old boys club, sorry, <laughs> but it, it, it was. It was seen as this elite status that people who had 40 years experience could get but it's not like that anymore. Chartership is a, is a kite mark for your achievement in your career at whatever stage you are at. Um, someone with five years experience could gain chartership as long as they can demonstrate that through whatever process you decide to implement. Um, they also show that it's, um, they also have chartership because it shows um, it's an opportunity to be involved with a broader network that might not otherwise have been accessed if, if they didn't have the chartership status. Um, so networking with other professional bodies at events um, and things like that outside of their discipline. Um, it also enables knowledge sharing and best practice um, and also indicates that those people in that profession are at a set standard and it raises the profile of the profession. Um, so I also sent out a little questionnaire to some of our registrants as well to get why they, to ask why they felt chartership was important to them. And it was very similar to what the professional bodies um, were saying, but it was more <coughs> about the satisfaction that it gave them in their job role, knowing that they've achieved a certain level and it's demonstrating that they've built upon their their qualifications that they gained at university or wherever they might have gained their qualifications. Um, they also feel that it demonstrates their professionalism to colleagues in a, in a wider network and that it's cross-discipline, cross-disciplinary. So someone with a chartership or a registered title could go outside of their sector and be recognised that they are at a set level, a set standard as well. So again, very similar to um, what the licensed bodies were feeling. And this is my last slide. I've kind of gone through this quite quickly. <laughs> I'm a little bit nervous, as you might guess. Um, so overall, chartership um, or professional registration is a kite mark of achievement that is internationally recognised um, across several different sectors and disciplines. It boosts pride amongst individuals as well as professional bodies and helps raise the profile of disciplines 
and your sectors. So I'm going to leave it there because I've missed loads out, but you can ask me lots of questions <laughs> afterwards. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I wondered if you could just say perhaps a little bit more about the different ways that scientists are charted, as in the process they have to go through. Um, it's different at every single professional body, um, but the, the main focus of getting chartered is competency-based. Um, chartered scientists has 14 competencies over five areas um, that they have to meet in order to be judged as competent as a chartered scientist. Um, for individual licensed bodies, charterships, if it's engineering based, it could be an exam, it could be an interview, it could just be paper based. Um, but again, it's always meeting those set standards, so set competencies. Um, a lot of our professional bodies will do it as a pure paper based exercise. Um, but that's just their preference because they feel that people can write write it down better. A lot of them will have interview as their main main focus of assessing the competence, um, which again you can see the pros and cons of that because like today I get quite flustered. I wouldn't. I don't know if I'd be able to do an interview. <laughs> um, I'd probably be able to write it down better. Um, but some people thrive with being sat in front of people demonstrating their achievements and not showing off a little bit but you know projecting what they know better um, but it is down to the core competencies and that's really down to the licensed bodies or the professional bodies to decide what they feel their competencies are. Most charterships are set at level, master's level um, or above. Um, we do have a couple of professional bodies that set it at bachelor's because they see that throughout your career you will naturally progress to working at that master's level. Um, but again, that's down to where you want to set your chartership. It's completely down to your own preferences and how you want to see your chartership being viewed um, to your membership. Any questions from the floor? Can I just ask you a little bit more about what you mean by it's set at master's level or bachelor's level? Do you mean that if somebody goes to university and they get their master's, then they immediately get a they, charge? No, it, it just means that they, that they are operating at that level. We, at the Science Council, we try and move away from master's level or undergraduate. We use the, it used to be the qualifications credit framework. It's now the regulated qualifications framework. And we use their levels to set it's like the minimum that someone has to be in order to gain chartership, but they don't have to have got a qualification at that level in order to go for chartership. They can demonstrate through their work experience how they're at that level um, instead. Because someone with 20 years experience without any qualifications could be just as good as someone with a master's degree with five years experience or a bachelor's degree with six years experience. It's all about how they demonstrate how they've met those competencies and the work that they've been involved in. Sorry, there's a question following in my head and I'm not sure I'm capable of articulating it properly, but I guess it's a two-parter. Um, the Science Council seems to have two closely related but very different roles, one of which is licensing bodies to award chartered scientists, and yeah. the other is as a, as a place coming together for other bodies that award their own chartered status. Yeah, exactly. So you presumably, for chartered scientists, you have to be confident that any licensed body is meeting certain criteria to your satisfaction. Yeah, we go out and audit. We yeah. go out and produce, we call them license reviews, so yes. we go out and we check that the, life, the professional bodies are sticking to our standards and then assessing fairly um, and we're trying to standardise that across all of our licensed bodies at the moment. Um, so, so all of them are, are basically doing pretty much the same thing, haven't they? And you like yeah, it's all, it's, yeah it's, it's all a competency based exercise, yeah. whether that's um, done through qualifications and then competence the competence report or what a lot of people call an experiential learning report. Um, 
So it, it, it does vary, but the core is a competence. Yeah. They are all d assessing charter status through a competence-based route. And then, but then the the other route to charter state, or the other routes to charter status, people have by becoming a charter engineer or charter what, charter whatever. Mm -hmm. um, those criteria for charter status are very different, I assume, between. The organisations, do you have any say over that? You know? No, the, the, the Engineering Council set how they want Chartered Engineers to be set for Chartered Engineer, and yes. the same goes for the Society for the Environment and their Chartered Environmentalist status. Yes. Um, but again, it's still based on that core competence yeah. level and set on a criteria. There's, I think there are, um, for engineering, Chartered Engineer, there's something like 16 competencies for um, to gain Chartered Engineer and for Chartered Environmentalists there are 10. So, you know, it's still all about demonstrating competence against sure. those standards. Um, but the way it's assessed is completely different, unless it's for, it's for Chartered Engineer where it's mandatory to have an interview, it's mandatory for a Chartered Environmentalist as well. But, so essentially, I guess, the, you have, you as a science council have a lot of control over chartered scientists, <laughs> but over chartered something else that's awarded by an individual chartered body, we control their ultimate address with the privy council. Yeah, it, it could, yeah it's, it's down to the licensed body to manage their own chartership. Yeah. Um, we have no say in, it's your chartership, you own it, we have no say. We might say, we might want to do it a little bit differently, and yeah. you can go, <laughs> you know, it's got nothing to do with us, but the Chartered Scientist title is our protected title, so we have a vested interest to make sure it's being assessed properly. Thank you. Could you say a little bit more about the competencies if I want to be a sort of chartered chemist or a chartered <coughs> biologist? Do, do I become a chartered scientist and it, it's not subject specific or is that subject specific? Yeah, so the, the Royal Society of Chemistry has their own charterships, they have chartered chemists, so they have their own application process to meet chartered chemists, which is again competency based, but it's a report based um, and evidence based process. And then charter scientist is something that you would do alongside that application. Okay. So chartered chemist is your specialism and chartered scientist would be your discipline, like your core discipline that everything is you build upon that science, but also chartered scientists would demonstrate your broader understanding of the science that you use, whereas chartered chemist is very specific, and so does chartered biology, and chartered physics, chartered physicists, and chartered psychologists, and chartered um, water and environment manager, um, chartered IT professors, there's so many, so many like unique chartership's out there. Um, it strikes me that with some of those sort of unique job shifts, you know, water environment manager, I kind of assume that you need to understand a little bit about water chemistry, perhaps a little bit about water mm -hmm. monitoring, perhaps a little, bit, a little yeah. bit about, you know, kind of water contamination and measurement. Mm -hmm. And if I wanted to find someone that could come out and measure some of those things on the site, mm -hmm. I'd go, oh, I know, I'm going to look for a chartered one of those. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just thinking about the, the breadth of our discipline. Does a chartered archaeologist mean the same if you're a geophysicist or you're a ceramic specialist? Are we looking at a chartered institute that encompasses all of that in some sort of core competencies <coughs> that are separate, or do we end up with a chartered geophysicist working as a chartered archaeologist? You would you would see them answer the competencies in very different ways, and the more applications you process, the more assessors you would get in those separate disciplines. So they could be chartered archaeologists, but they would be a chartered archaeologist as a geophysicist or a pottery expert, but they would be a chartered archaeologist. And that's how they would, dem they would, dem they would tailor their answers specifically to their experience. So in water and environment management, we don't have separate, we don't have a water, chartered water chemist, there's not a chartered drainage, expert, they would go to the Chartered Institute of Waste Management, so they would be waste managers. Um, but from that umbrella title, 
people would understand that you might be a geophysicist, a uh, metallurgist, uh, you know, or a field archaeologist. They would get that from that overall title and by going to your website or looking at that person's experience. And in assessing the application, you would send it out to... You would send it out, yeah, with the same... Yeah, the you wouldn't send it out to on. someone that didn't have that background. You would need to... Um, a lot of people have what we call a grandparenting route. So if, you can ident if you've identified people who would already fit the bill, let's say, so they don't have to go through your application process, the full application process. They just have to write a little bit about how they meet the competencies. You could automatically award them chartered archaeologist status, but make sure they're covering the disciplines that you want to capture with your chartered archaeologist, and then they would become your assessors. So you would then send the applications <coughs> relevant to those to that up those assessors and then you would decide whether you want to do an interview based process paper based process or a paper and interview based process which is what it is at the Chartered Institute at Simon the Chartered Institute of Water and Environmental Management is a paper and interview based process to try and capture what people may have missed on their paper form but again it's what you you've got to decide what's best for your members you don't want to put them through a stressful interview process if that's how they're going to view it, um, or put them through a paper base and get them all flustered because they don't know how, they're not very good at writing it down, it, you, you've got to judge how you would like that application process to be. Um, and what we always say is if it's interview based, you've got to try and promote it as it's not an interview, that's why we use, the, we use it as a professional review process. It's an opportunity for them to talk to you about their achievements. You're not trying to catch them out. Um, it can be as, as leading as you like. It, you can just sit there and go, tell me about your experience, sit there and just not say anything else. It, it's, it's all down to how you would want the process to be. Just a, a comment really on, on, on Jim's question about subsets of our very, very broad discipline. That when we started, well, the reason we started on the path down towards chartering the institute was with a view to being able to award chartered archaeologists that broad, broad title. Um, and we went down that path because we previously consulted the membership about how they felt about a much easier route for charter status for our members, which was to get licensed by the Society for the Environment as a body labeled towards chartered environmentalists. But the, the response coming back from the members was pretty unequivocal that no, we, if, if we're going to be chartered, we want to be chartered as archaeologists. But then, yeah, the whole problem about you know, a chartered archaeologist who studies pollen as opposed to a buildings analyst or a forensic archaeologist or, or, or a landscape archaeologist is quite a tricky one. It's the process could be that you, you get your chartered archaeology status. And then later down the line, when you identify these people that don't quite fit into that status, then look at becoming licensed with the Society of the Environment or the Science Council or the Engineering Council. Um, because that you need to get the process sorted first for yourselves and understand how you want that process to look. Um, the process is for Science Council and the Engineering Council and the Environment, Society of the Environment are they're established and you could come to us for ideas on how you can do yours but you know you can do it that way or you can become chartered with the Society for the Environment get that established process in and then do chartered archaeologists but I think you need to get chartered archaeologists first mm -hmm. and and have that established and then think about how you service those people that are outside and the technician levels I know you're doing a lot with apprenticeships and technicians at the moment um, it's how you service those and provide the best for your membership. It's sort of like starting premises that you shouldn't have anyone in outside. If we're, if we're here because we're archaeologists, then mm. the competence has got to be available so that I can say, well, I'm, you know, I'm an archaeologist, but actually I've studied this, well, mm -hmm. I'm an archaeologist. If you're an archaeologist, you're an archaeologist. It's, it's a yeah. yeah, I think that, that's a question of, of, of breadth, isn't it? There yeah. might be people in the membership who are not eligible for chartership because of high testing, well, they haven't met the criteria, but the, the breadth of the discipline has got to catch all of us. Mm -hmm. 
great ritual in the NASA. Um, well, we're kind of doing this anyway because we've got, you know, I mean, as chair of validation in the past, I mean, presumably people are currently on validation, I don't know. Not anymore. Not anymore. There's other people more recent than me on, on, on validation. But at the moment, we validate people for Lita, Stand, you know, MC Fur, and, and all our, all our three different corporate grades of membership mm -hmm. um, across the whole wide range of um, specialisms within oncology. And yes, the specialist groups within CFA advise on the best way of, of using the existing competency matrix that we use for those specialisms. So we're doing it already. Um, so it, as long as the profession's got sort of um, confidence in our ability that we're doing it pretty well, you know, we're mostly doing it mostly all right, which I guess is as good as one can yeah. with um, assessing competency, mm -hmm. then you know it's not it's actually not rocket science even for us. As an organisation we used to award a tech membership on the basis of an area of core competence. Mm -hmm. You have to say, say that and you feel that's important. We got rid of that, but we sort of do it in the, in the way we assess it. Obviously, people have a core competence. It used to be that when you say you'd write MC for them, and then a lot of our members would write brackets building or brackets whatever to say what that core competence was. Mm -hmm. And so it was clear from their actual, well, they'd write Nietzsche at the time, um, <laughs> their, from their actual qualification with us what that area was. Does that work with, for instance, the site council? Are you chartered side brackets biology? Or is there no way to tell from your chartership with the science council that you have to go to their CV and get the to work out who they are? We don't we don't hold membership. We hold registration. Okay. So we license the in the Royal Society of Biology to have our registration, to have our chartered registration and our registered science technician and registered scientists and charter science teacher now. Um, so that individual is a member of the Royal Society of Biology. So from their membership with their professional body, you know that they're a biologist, but they've got chartered scientists as well to demonstrate their breadth of knowledge within this, this, the entire discipline of science. Um, so we are not a membership organisation as such. There's a sort of organisation that's had that status to award bread recently. How do you deal with the sort of first initial bow wave of applications? Or because you're licensing other bodies, were you actually able to filter that out to all the other bodies for them to, to deal with? Or, or did you have that sort of first initial spike as it came in when everybody went brilliant? Yeah, because we're because we're the licensing body, we didn't see those applications. It's the professional bodies that dealt with the applications. So that was what my job was when I worked for SciWare. I, I dealt with those applications, and then sent the names to the science council, and then the science council deal with it at their end, um, put them on the online register and things like that. But we're actually in an interesting point of our. Um, licensing agreements with our professional bodies because we've just introduced what we call the common application process. So for our for our registered scientists and registered science technician, we now process applications from people that are not already in a membership organisation. They come to us and say, I don't know where I want to go, but I know I want to be registered. So they go through the online process and then we, we say, right, pick a licensed body now, now you've got a bit more knowledge about the thing. Oh, I'm a biologist, I'll go to the Royal Society of Biology. Then we pass it all over to the Royal Society of Biology, then they take it from there. So we, we are now starting to process applications, but they are still not members of the Science Council, they're registrants of the Science Council. What's the, um, I mean, this might, might be too broad a question in a way, because you've got so many constituent bodies that you mm -hmm. license, but do you have a feel for what the sort of demand is for, for chartered status? Is it unusual not to be chartered in your career as a scientist? We're trying to make it the norm. Mm -hmm. We're trying to make becoming chartered or registered the norm mm -hmm. so that it's something that they aspire to. Mm -hmm. um, we deal with a lot of healthcare professions, and so there's a, a lot of regulated bodies that we have to compete with. So at the moment, we're trying to say, you know, you've, you've got your regulated healthcare 
um, registration, but you've, you now, you know, charter scientists is a step above that. It's, a, you know, you, you are, we're using the, the analogy of lists and ladders, is what the CEO described it as yesterday. Um, we're a ladder. We can get you through your career progression and get you to demonstrate the different achievements at each line, but regulated professions is a list. So you're on that list, you have to be on that list in order to practice. So you have that, but then you want to demonstrate over and above that with your ladder, with your ladder. <laughs> so trust archaeologists would be your, the ladder for archaeologists and demonstrating how they've got there um, throughout their career. Any more questions? Am I, am I saying too much? Like I wanted to explore something, thinking about what Rachel was saying just now about how we reckon our system for assessing applications for membership under the current process is, is pretty good, really, actually. We're, we're, we're very confident in it. Um, but like any professional body, what we're looking for when we're accrediting people is technical competence and ethical competence. And I think that what we are very, very good at measuring is technical competence. Ethical competence we do by assertion, really. We get people to say, yes, I will comply with the code of conduct, but they don't actually give us any evidence of how they have complied with mm -hmm. that in the past. Um, and that, I think, is quite interesting when looking at what the difference might be between current membership systems and charts and status. And I was wondering if you could say anything about, well, in, in, in the bit that you own, which is chartered scientist, how you examine the ethical understandings and, and abilities of, of applicants? Well, we, we have two competencies based solely around the code of conduct and, and ethical um, conduct within yes. science. Yeah. Um, and they, they have to demonstrate how they've adhered to a code of conduct and basically make a declaration that they will adhere. Um, and we also get them to demonstrate CPD because that is adhering to ethical conduct as well. Because if you're keeping yourself up to date, you're less likely to do anything wrong. If you're not keeping yourself up to date, that's where problems arise and then things go terribly wrong. And, and that, so that examination of, 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 of an applicant's understanding of the code of conduct, mm. how, how is that conducted? Like? Is that written? It's that? written, it's, it's all part of the, the, the standard um, application form against the standards, so they have to write about it. And if if it's interview based, you can draw that out a little bit more yeah. um, than what it would be on paper. But you have to take them at their word as well. Yeah. There's got to be that element of professionalism where you, they are professionals at the end of the day, and you can't say, "Well, actually, no, you're not," um, because that that might be their level of professionalism, and that's what they want to adhere to. So. Pete's interested in ethics, and I'm interested in money. <laughs> as a science council, and you work with chartered scientists, mm -hmm. do you have any say in, what, in how much the constituent bodies charge for the process of chartership? And even if not, do you <coughs> see in your licensing reviews how the sort of fees that are charged? And is there a big disparity? Sorry, I've There's rolled about three questions into the world. There's a massive disparity. Right. Um, for chartered scientists, we charge a £25 <coughs> annual fee. That's, that's it, £25. That, there's no application fee for it. We just say when they're registered, they pay £25. And they pay, they pay that annually and have to do CPD or a, a CPD revalidation every year in order to keep the title. Um, our licensed bodies, on the other hand, um, I'm going to use SIWEM as an example because it's one of the highest. Um, so it's a bit extreme, so just brace yourself. Um, application is £150. Then they pay a £250 interview fee. Then they pay a pro rata application fee if it's, it's about a year. Um, a full application is for a chartered member £250, for a fellow is £300 and they also charge an administration fee of £30 if people have any additional charterships like chartered scientists or chartered environmentalists or chartered engineers. 
So that's one of the highest. <laughs> we do have licensed bodies who charge no application fee. They will charge a nominal fee of £20 for an interview and then they'll charge the £25 for Science Council and the £50 annual membership. It's really what you want to see. In defence of SIWEM, they get a lot of applications. On what they term as bulk interview days, they could be interviewing 50 people in one day. So they've got to cover the expense of um, 12 assessors for that day as well as the hiring out the room to conduct it. So their fees are high, but it's reflected in the cost because of how they conduct their application process. They've got to be able to reimburse that. And that's really yeah. helpful, thank you. And just could I ask as a follow-up, and then you may feel you could answer it about it, but is there an element of, of you know, you get what you pay for and the, 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 the better systems are the ones by and large, that people pay a bit more for, or is it, you're not in a position to make any correlation? There's, there's no correlation. There's, no. there's some licensed bodies that charge very little, but do so much for their members. They offer every a lot other than the tangible benefits of a magazine, whereas there's licensed bodies out there that will charge a lot, and the only benefit is they get a magazine and then letters after their name. So it's all about what you want to give your members for their money. Basically, okay. and is, is there a, is there a correlation then between um, the reliance on volunteers in, in the assessment process? As yeah, to paid staff? there's only because it's a peer review process. Um, a lot of them use volunteers only to assess mm -hmm. because a lot of staff members. I, I I couldn't have assessed a water application because I have no background in in water. I I was there to sense check that it was all there. After five years working there, by the end of it, I could identify whether someone was competent or not because I'd got that experience and built it up. But straight out of uni, I, I was like, mm, I don't know, I don't. <laughs> I'm gonna pass it to my assessors now, they'll assess it, they send it back with their comments, and then I feedback to the applicant and invite them for interview or not invite them for interview. Um, so it, it's, yeah. It's, again, it's, yes. there's, there's only one licensed body that uses staff, mm -hmm. and that's the British Computer Society. They don't rely on volunteers at all. Mm -hmm. They only use staff members. Any, any other questions? Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. That's really, really useful. The timetable as drafted, which like all good timetables, is, is, is flexible and, and fluid and subject to uh, variation. Um, is is to consult over the rest of this year and probably well into next year as well. There's a point where we'll need to go to the Privy Council with our initial thoughts and, and say and get some informal feedback to say are we on are we on the right lines? Does this look like like um, something that might um, uh, pass through scrutiny? Um, to then hopefully um, take a final option. There'll be consultation, both formal and less formal, along the way. With, with members and also with stakeholders because that's a, a, another important part of this is to be talking to people who aren't our members but work, work alongside of maybe potential members um, and the national agencies and, and the like um, with the idea of hopefully taking a proposal to, a, to an AGM perhaps in, in 2018. Once, once a formal submission has gone into the Privy Council office obviously the timetable is, is entirely out of our hands and, and it could be it could be six weeks, it could be six months. Hopefully, it won't be six years um, before we get an answer. If we do get a positive answer from the Privy Council Office, then I think it probably wouldn't be unreasonable to think in terms of twelve months worth of work for us to put the infrastructure in place to be able to launch Chartered Archaeologists Van. And as you say, we will have the conundrum of how we assess the first wave of Chartered Archaeologists. Um, whether whether we need to bring in some kind of grand, grandparent rights into that um, and how we do it. So that's the end of the process. To come right back to the beginning, these are the questions that we've been asking um, as as part of the workshop. So, what do we do? We want chartered archaeologists, and, and and really, what do we want it for? Because that's something that's come back from talking to other institutes. Is um, the sense that they hadn't necessarily thought through 
what it means to be a chartered professional in their area. And I think that's something that we, um, that there was a, a speaker that we had from the Chartered Institute of Librarians and Information Professionals, and I remember speaking to him um, men, well, many years ago at a, a conference, and he said, if, if you ask me why you should use a chartered librarian, I'm not sure I'd be able to tell you as opposed to an uncharted one. What, what would be the downside? And I think we need to know what the answer is to that question before we, before we go down this route. Uh, we need to think about who needs to be one and then whether there are other archaeologists who want to be one. So at what point would that become crucial? And you can imagine anybody who stands up at a public inquiry might need to be and gives evidence might need to be chartered, but um, somebody who is uh, a very eminent and experienced pottery specialist, for example, might not need to be, but might want to be as part of their career development. And that's those are two two subtleties that we need to to be aware of and, and make sure that we that we reconcile. There's a big question around how do you get it, um, and that's something we'll talk about in a little bit more detail today. And then how does it relate to existing membership grades, and what's the impact of bringing a new designation in to our existing members and to, to people who aren't members at the moment. So um, the sense, I suppose, that if we bring in a chartered archaeologist grade that sits above member, do our, do our MC for suddenly feel that they've been downgraded? Is that a negative impact on them? Um, and there's a, there's a, there's a, a sort of a cost-benefit analysis, I suppose, and a, and a bit of a SWOT analysis for each of these options as we go through, and we can do a bit more of that after, after the tea break. So, in terms of the workshops so far, we've asked the question, what's it for? What's chartered status for? And there's been pretty much consensus around that, some, a very clear response, I think, from, from, from the delegates of the workshop about what they think chartered um, status is for. So, very much about self-regulation, very much about professional standards and raising the profile of the profession internally with ourselves, having more self-confidence as a profession, but also with the people that we work alongside, um, parity of esteem, the idea that if you're a chartered archaeologist in, in a design team, for example, that the engineers and the architects and the, and the surveyors and, and whoever else is on that design team know that you've been through the same sorts of processes as they have and that you've reached a level of, of, of as Pete says, te technical and ethical competence that's comparable to theirs. So we're on, I think we're on fairly safe ground with that question at the moment. When we talked about who needs to be a chartered archaeologist or who should be an archaeologist, the responses of, of and whilst there are, there are a lot of nuances in there, have, have kind of formed into two camps, really. So one is, as you referred to, the idea of, of, of chartered um, status as being senior, exclusive, um, a, a much, much sought-after brand, if you like, at the top of the tree, the pinnacle of your career. Um, and then another one, another idea that really we're talking about the demonstration of professionalism and we're marking the end of, of formal training and the emergence of a, of a professional person. Um, and looking at examples from different professional bodies, there are certainly examples in both of those camps. Um, they're both, I, I've not looked as enough to, to work out whether there's an even split across the chartered professions and in fact that the wide range of chartered professions is, is almost bewildering, actually, when you look at the number of chartered bodies um, that there are. So that's something that we need to think about, is where we pitch this. And advice from the Privy Council Office, I think probably fairly early on in the process, has been to, to pitch quite high to make it a sought-after brand. But we've also talked to professional bodies who followed that advice and then found that actually very few people pursued chartered status because it was too high and it was too onerous and it was too expensive and they could practice perfectly well without it. So why change? And I think that might you might see that reflected in some of the longer established professional bodies where it has long been, as in for hundreds of years, part of your professional development that you become chartered, that it's not questioned. Whereas in the newer chartered bodies, there's a much bigger marketing task to sell that to members because they've practiced for a long time without it. How do you get it? Um, these are some of the things that have come up from the examples that we looked at from other professional bodies. So <coughs> assessment of competence, um, accreditation pathways is a phrase that comes up quite a lot, career pathways, something that we've been talking about quite a bit, 
CPD is integral to the process, as you would imagine, but I think what we certainly liked about some of the examples we looked at um, was the structured and possibly supported CPD. So at the moment, we don't define competencies. Um, we have a competence matrix that sets levels of competence across areas like knowledge and autonomy and coping with complexity, but we don't define what those competencies might be. And some of our special interest groups have been um, compiling matrices for their own specialist areas, which might start to do that. We might start to be able to pull out competencies like that. But we don't say, for example, that a chartered archaeologist or a, a member of the institute at the moment would need to know about um, legislative and policy frameworks, for example. We don't expect that of our members, um, and perhaps we should. Uh, portfolio demonstrating competence. So again, in a, in a, a, a as, as you mentioned, a lot of paper-based systems, I don't imagine that formal examinations is going to be a way that we would we would a route we would go down. And it seems that a lot of professional bodies that used to set exams are moving away from doing that for all sorts of reasons. Um, and in a in a practically based profession, I think we would be expecting evidence to be presented in, in a portfolio rather than in a in a, in, a, in an essay, as it were. Um, and then a professional review and interview, and that's something that's come out as being um, potentially a really useful way to test particularly ethical knowledge and competence. So that's that's what we like at the moment um, from the other examples. When we come to look at how, how chartered status might relate to um, existing membership grades, there are a number of options. Um, I've listed in the report, just in bullet point form, some of the thoughts that people had at the workshops. Um, and, and you will see that they are many and, 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 and varied. Um, so there are a number of options. One is to think about chartered status as another step in the hierarchy of, of membership grades. Um, so you would take a, a, a simple a ladder analogy is, is, is quite useful, um, and that we bring in chartered archaeologists to sit above MC for um, expand our existing competency matrix to allow for that extra grade of, of, of seniority. Another option is that it's completely separate. We keep our existing grades of membership and we have chartered archaeologists as a separate designation. It sits alongside, it has its own membership process and is something different. And I suppose the analogy to that would be your, um, uh, your professional bodies who have their own members, so you're a member of the Royal Society of Biology, but you're also a chartered scientist. So um, it, it's, it's almost two separate processes. Another option would be almost to phase in chartered archaeologist status. So you have the option to transfer um, from existing membership grades and possibly over time, and this was one of the questions that came up, who would want to be a member of the Chartered Institute as opposed to being a chartered archaeologist? Would anybody see that as being an end in itself in terms of their career development and their professional status? Um, so we might imagine that over time we'd end up with fewer members but they would be replaced by chartered archaeologists and possibly associates as well because that's the other, if we look at that, that model of, of chartered status that is more about uh, marking professionalism and the end of your formal training, that might actually be more appropriate to our current associate grade rather than our current member grade. That's something that we need to think about. Um, and the other option is to hold, throw the whole thing out the window. So apologies, validation committee members, um, is, is to chuck the whole lot out and start again from scratch. And, that, and that's an option. And whilst it's an option that, that might incur a sharp intake of breath from validation colleagues, um, it's a bit, anybody who's had an old car will know that actually at the end of the process of trying to keep that old car on the road, you would have spent less money if you'd just gone and been able to go out and buy a new one at the start. Um, and maybe bolting something onto an existing system isn't necessarily the best way of, of doing it. So we do have an option to start with a clean sheet. There's no reason why we have to work this around our existing processes if we don't feel that that's the, the, the right way to do it. And I think the conclusions really, and I've put some quotes into the report um, just really to give you a sense of the comments that were, that were coming back in the workshops. 
um, about what people's aspirations were for a chartered archaeologist um, process and that we need to ensure that it's robust and, and trusted by our members and by our stakeholders um, but it also needs to be affordable and it needs to be practicable um, and there are financial and practical implications for all these different options and, and how we run them and what we can't end up with really as was suggested by one of the delegates is the sort of the gold standard gold plated system that actually nobody can afford um, because there isn't a pot of money to subsidise this it's going to have to be self-funding through through fees um, so that's something that we that we do need to to, to bear in mind so um, I think I'm going to leave that there actually um, for the moment and we'll come back to the options um, after after tea break um, in, in a bit more detail and what I'd like to do is get you into into groups to look at these different options and to really try and pull them apart and, and break them um, and identify where the where the issues would be and what the strengths and weaknesses of those different options are.